Slozy, aka Mike Pearson, became part of the SOS family and a friend relatively early on in our SOS journey. He's a very present person who finds playfulness and fun in even the mundane, latching onto stories big and small to capture the eccentricities, highs and lows of everyday life. In the beginning, I thought of him as a Philly-based indie rock artist, but by now I know that is far too small a box to put him in, as he makes music on love, hard-hitting trap music, vibey rock music, and more. He's just a lover of music, and an artist that latches on to the feelings and stories that move him. One of his most popular songs, for instance, is called Bed Bugs, and it's on insomnia, and was based on his lived experience struggling to sleep in a dingy, bug-infested college dorm room he once called home. In this conversation, we talk about bed bugs, but we go everywhere from his newfound love of trap music and interest in Korean R&B to advertising brand st- storytelling to genre-bending modern music and the stories that have inspired his music and life and much more. I laughed my way through much of the conversation and was left with a sense of nostalgia as I let my mind run and latch onto all the small stories that have made my life what it is. From the feeling of getting an ice cream cone after a baseball game, inspired by Slozy's vanilla bean story, to the feeling of taking a nap on my grandmother's couch, and so many more. I hope he inspires the same in you. Before we dive in, here's a quick rundown on what's going on at SOS this week. On Instagram, we'll be profiling contemporary indie artists you can't miss. Last week, we also released our top eight meaningful musicians to watch in 2021. That was a lot of fun to put together, so please do check it out. Let us know who's missing, what you think of the artists on it, really anything at all. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, that's it. Let's go. Here's Slozy. It's it changed. Crazy. How how has it been for you, like as a musician? Because you know everybody I'm talking uh-huh. to. Yeah, are you writing mostly then, or are you like? Because I know you just launched your album, but I mean, how are you thinking about yeah. this? Period? Are you trying to be productive? I yeah, I've been trying to be productive the whole time. So the beginning was like recording and like learning on how to do release thing things and like the business aspects. Um, and then I released. Then I took a big break, and then I got motivated again. And I already have a bunch of stuff written. And I'm, I'm like writing like all my roommates. All right. All my roommates are like a year or two years younger than me in college. Cause I, I took a gap year, did an extra year. And all they do is just listen to trap. Uh, and we're all just cooped up in the house together, like all the time. And so like for them to entertain them, you know, and just for fun, like I've just started making a bunch of like trap and like rap stuff. And it's so funny because like in my music, I usually, it's like very sweet and cute usually as far as lyrics go. So I don't curse. I don't say anything, but in these songs, I've just been like saying like the worst like lyrics that I can think of. And it's such a fun exercise, honestly. Yeah. You're going from like indie rock to trap, man. I love it. Yeah. But, um, I'm working on like two records right now concurrently and then like one or two singles with a couple friends that are like collaborations. So that's fun. But everything's going at like a slow pace. Everything's pretty cool. How would you describe what's what's upcoming these two different albums are they trapped then or are they elements like no, your last album or no i need to i'm new to the trap game i need to work on my skills hone hone my skills for a while um, hey man that's what soundcloud's time. for just drop them dude yeah i really might i really might do something like that soon um but uh for the records one of them is like so my band is kind of disassembled with the pandemic people graduating everyone's just kind of split but we have a, like a whole nother like records worth of songs that we did that we did together before during, for like live shows. Um, so we're recording that. But then I also have a whole nother like full length album that's just like all songs I never did with my band that are just like cutesy love songs. And so I'm like hiring a studio drummer online and working with him and then just recording everything else myself. Very cool. I love it. Trap and love songs. Trap and love songs. That is very 2020. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just trying to get in all the, it's all fun to me. Like I could do so many different types of music, but some of them are just easier than others, you know? So what's coming out of Philly then? Like in particular, because I I know you're tapping the Philly music scene, obviously being there, like, and Philly is such an interesting music scene to me because like 
it's such a multifaceted scene. It's kind of hard to describe. It's super underground and driven. And I have a hard time knowing even when I interact with it. So what's, what's the scene like these days? Philly is interesting because it's, as a city, it feels very small, but the music scene feels very big. Like there's so much that it's like hard to even see, see parts of it because I do mostly like indie rock kind of stuff. Um, although I've hosted a lot of different types of shows over the past couple of years, but um, the, the rap game I would say is the strongest, but also like it's so, it's at such a high, high level that I haven't even like touched it barely because like I just hear about all these rappers coming out of Philly and I'm like, I never heard of them until they were already famous, even though I live in Philly, which is interesting. Hmm. So who's inspiring you right now then? Hmm, for, for my trap that I'm working on? Sure. I meant in general, but definitely, I, definitely let's start with the trap. There's this one song that my roommate showed me and I listen to it like every day. Uh, the artist's name is Lil Mosey and it's called Blueberry Fago. Blueberry it's, Fago. I don't even know what Fago means. What could it, I don't know. That doesn't like, matter. F-A-Y-T-O. That, exactly. It doesn't matter. The song just bumps. <laughs> so that's great. Um, in terms of other stuff, I feel like there have been some really cool female artists that I've been listening to lately that are like in the like sort of rock area. There's one uh, called Kate Bollinger, who's amazing, I'm called Faye Webster, also amazing. Although I will say the thing that I listen to by far the most right now, it's really strange. I don't know how I got here, is Korean R&B. No like way. So much, like so much. And I met someone not long ago who also did, and we just were able to talk for like so long. So how do you know Korean R&B when you happen across it? Because I can recognize the language at this point, like, because I've always been really into um, like Japanese culture. Uh, and so like, I'm teaching myself Japanese on like Duolingo as well. Um, so like, I know Japanese and I know Chinese well enough that I can like tell like, oh, this is, they're singing in Korean, like I could tell. And then I just like know the style. But what's this thing about the style then, sonically? How does it sound? The way that I like to think about it is, so you have, like, U.S. pop, right? Uh, And then rock is sort of like, you can think of rock as an offshoot of that in terms of the sound that comes out, how it's produced and stuff. So you have that, but think about your ideas of K-pop and then the rock that spins off of that and, like, the R&B that spins off of that. And that is, like, what it sounds like. You know what I mean? Like, produced, like, K-pop, but, like it's there's it's got that bite to it still you know it's got that soul i don't know it's it's awesome wow you okay you gotta give you gotta send me some musicians like do you do you know Dude, I have off a top your playlist. head I have, um <laughs> they have these crazy one's called cheese one's called bb um there's one's called cold but like with an e at the end they just like choose these random english words most of the time it's uh it's crazy but they're they're really good spotify just feeds them to me and I'm like, I like this one. I like this one. I like this. Those Spotify rabbit weird. holes. Yeah, it kind of owns me right now. It really does. It's pretty, I haven't really like gone out of my way to seek new music in a while because it's just being fed to me, which is really interesting. And that, so yeah, I mean, the more artists I speak with too, and even non-artists, that tends to be how it's done. I mean, even myself, it's a lot of Spotify playlist driven and then I have a couple things that I follow just to try to find new music in general. But it is, I mean, a lot it of- It really makes them own the industry in a crazy way. Because they choose things. who you're exposed to. Which is true of across media right now. I mean, you go on YouTube, they decide pretty much what you see and what you view. And most people only view the videos that are on their explore list. I mean, or they search it out specifically along a tagline, but eventually that leads to what it feeds you. You know, yeah. it goes across, you have Netflix for TV shows and movies. And, and so it, it is a lot of algorithmic decision-making across media in general. So it makes sense that we'd have gotten to this point here. Hmm. How much do you, how much do you cultivate your social media? What, what kind of stuff do you follow? So do you look at? I view social media as like different personalities. So like, I really feel that this is actually a larger thing that we're going to have to live with as people of the, of the 21st century. At least in my view is that we're going to have different parts of us 
that are personified in different areas of our life. Like they're, and that is best played out on social media, I think right now, because I have Leland on Instagram. I have Leland on Facebook. I, I have Leland on Snapchat, which is pretty much non-existent. And then I've got like <laughs> Leland on YouTube. So it really is, I have different u- interests. And Instagram is pretty much my main channel these days. Yeah. But that is curated mostly of hilarious memes and friends. <laughs> but yeah. it really is where I go for entertainment. YouTube is where I go for education. I like a lot of long form content. Same. Same for YouTube. I like philosophy. I like music. I like, you know, politics. And it's, it's really like, and then I've, I like some leaders in podcasts and things like that. So yeah. that's large there. Facebook is useless to me pretty much. I'm almost never on it, but I use the messenger app and stuff like that. And we'll occasionally post big live events. And then Snapchat, I almost never use, but mm. I have it anyway. How about for you though? I'm always curious. And the, our, the other channel that I've been experimenting with more and more, I'm spoken with the, on the, about it on the podcast as well is TikTok. Mm-hmm. That's another one that keeps exploding in the music scene too. I'd love to hear your thoughts in general on social media, but also if you have any on TikTok. Um, that's funny. In social media in general, I would say I'm not too different from you. My Instagram feels like I don't I don't follow any memes. I don't really follow any celebrity. I don't follow anyone I don't know generally. Um but I'll follow anyone who I've just like met and like, you know, it was a nice meeting or whatever. Um and but only like real people that I've like, you know um but at the same time so that's like how i use it but i feel like i project a, like artist me image at the same time so it's like my in and out are different um because i don't really like actively use it for that but i like you know it's listed on my stuff like oh my instagram's this whatever and like i post about it's like my name is slow music so it's just uh it's interesting and then for facebook slightly different because not so much right now but that's like so much of the music scene is operated through Facebook, which is really interesting. I've never liked it. No one likes it. Um, I've thought about making a startup to, to combat it, but I just, uh, I have too much going on in my life, you know? Yeah, and I, I mean, one of the things that has been driving us at SOS from the beginning was actually this thought on media in general about how media could play. Because I'm actually one of those people that really doesn't, blame Facebook. Uh, I just think that we need to start taking some of what Facebook has been doing away from it. And what I mean by that is like, I think that, and this is happening in a lot of markets and industries that are really hurting it. When the creation is muddled with the curation, it becomes really difficult to do things well and to do things in a way that's honest and like effective. And when you look at all these platforms, that's exactly what's going on to to talk about what we were talking about before, where Facebook now decides who and what you see Mm -hmm. pretty much. I mean, you have some control over it um, and that's what keeps you there, but they they decide on the ads that you see, they decide on what shows up on your timeline pretty much. I think that there's a lot of great media out there. There's a lot of great musicians out there who are making great and meaningful music. There are a lot of great people out there who are promoting things that really matter. They're talking about things that really matter. Um, but it's just harder than ever to find those people in the craziness that is the amount of content that's being created. I mean, it's next to impossible. So I think anyone who can solve that across channels too, because another thing is like, we look, we have to go to all these distributed places to find content. You have to go to Twitter to find written text and immediate thoughts of people. You have to go to Instagram to find like photos and videos and memes and et cetera. You have to go to YouTube to find the, the, the longer form videos too. I mean, it's like, there's these different channels that you have to go to. And for me, at least I've been using newsletters and I've been using friends who my DMs mm. for friends as a form of curation where they're telling me what I should look at based on what they've seen. But um, yeah, I think scaling out something like that would be very interesting. Something that we've been looking at a lot here at SOS too. How much, uh, how much of your, I guess, meme or whatever you look at content comes from your friend sending it to you? Because for me, it's like a decent amount, actually. Now that I'm yeah, about it. it wavers. And the, the higher the percentage from friends, the, the better mental health position I'm in generally. <laughs> uh, but it yeah, does depend. It. Sometimes I just go on sprees where I'm on, you know, I'm the one supplying my friends with memes. Mm. Uh, 
but a lot of times I have a couple friends who send me a bunch of memes and they're usually pretty funny and we all follow the same people. So they capture the best. There's stuff. this one guy who I met really randomly, something like four years ago. And he sent me one meme on Snapchat every single day for the past like a few years. Damn. It's crazy. It's like, a, I don't know, a daily routine. It's crazy. I don't know why. Exactly one does. meme? Yeah, daily. Oh. <laughs> You are know, they funny? Day, like, what kind of meme? You might miss a day. Someday there might be two, but you know, usually, you know, it's just like yeah. one a day. Well, what kind of memes are they? Are they funny? Are they across the board? Or what is it? They're funny. He is ex-military. And so he has a, a lot of them are like interestingly military related. A lot of them are just like kind of like these stupid snowflakes. Like just all like it's really across the board. But then some of them are just super funny. Like, I don't know. I don't really use Snapchat very much. I don't even know if I'm like logged in on my phone right now. So I don't really see them that much. But when I, whenever I go on there, I just have, you know, just a bunch. Well, that's fun too. And I, you know, it's like, it's cool because I've always been so interested in storytelling. Right. And, and that's like one of the reasons right. that I love music and particularly meaningful music is like the aspect of storytelling that music lets you do. But there's all these other interesting channels for telling stories now too. I mean, what's so fun is this like engaging short form content, the long form content, like all these different channels have exposed so much more, I think about ways of being creative around storytelling too. That's what I like. I saw one of the craziest ads I've seen in my entire life right before I logged onto this call. I was scrolling through the Facebook. It was deciding what I saw and I saw this Amazon ad shared by my like high school football coach. Although I didn't know it was an Amazon ad going in. He just said, this is the best marketing I've seen in my entire life. And I was like, okay, I'm in. And it was just this girl who was like a high schooler or something. And she was a dancer and she was getting all excited for her performance. And then like COVID got the performance canceled. And then like this whole thing happened where she performed outside in the snow and all of her neighbors watched from above. And it was like the show must go on. And it was like, Amazon. and I was like, whoa, that's storytelling. It was a, it was a beautiful story in the movie. Like Amazon was barely a part of it, but that's just exactly like the point. And that's so interesting. It was crazy. And, was and crazy. because what I love about that is it brings to light what the real purpose of storytelling is. So A, it's to share experiences occasionally to give you information, but it can also be just about giving you an emotion and saying, yeah. this is the emotion that I'm handing to you. And this is a, like vis audio visual is a great mechanism. Like when you tell a story quickly and that's what a lot of great advertisements do. They pull you in, they make you feel something fast. And then they, that's it. Like it's an emotion. And it's like, that is a, that's a great example of like, wow, like we're keeping the world moving, you know, and we're, it's going to, it's something uplifting to remember about, technology and about the period and and it's also tapping into that part of you that's feeling like the exasperation of having lost things in covid and so mm, you feel that yeah. release like even more but it's so weird that they just want to like give you this weird like mental like feeling and then be like just like associate yeah. just associate with this like emotion just but like, they're also, it's you great. You know because, what's it's still associated. Yeah, but it's also like brands like that. So that's what happens, I think, when you market as a big brand. Because as a small brand, you have the problem of that might not work because they still don't know who you are. Like they don't even yeah. understand the context. Amazon doesn't need to tell us who they are. Everybody no. knows who Amazon is. So now it's more about the advertising is not brand identity advertising, like you to understand what they do or go to buy and sell their service. It's trying to make you think more highly of their brand, feel happier about their brand. So because yeah. that's what their goal is, it's easier to do those types of advertisements because they don't care at all about, it's about winning hearts and minds because Amazon's biggest problems now is not the se selling products. People are going crazy on Amazon. It's defending against the belief that it's a monopoly that's hurting our businesses and it's changed the way that our society operates for the worse. And so that's why these advertising campaigns are all the more interesting and powerful because they, they're not just about selling products and services. A lot of the it's time. Honestly like, it's like lobbying, but to the yeah. people. And <laughs> that's to exactly politics. what it is because being, once you become powerful, 
it's you've got it's it's more about how you control image than anything else because that's really what's going to buffet you over time and so you yeah, want people I, to believe in you it's, so it's different crazy. yeah and I, but that's why i mean i really think that like I love silly music. I love music that's meaningless a lot of the time too. Like I love silly trap music or whatever it might be. Cause it, because one thing that when you say meaningful music, it doesn't necessarily have to be like it's like words, right? It doesn't have to be, we even talked that to this, uh, talked about this with contributors before where one of our contributors came to us with a song. They didn't end up actually writing on it, but they came to us with a song that had no lyrics. And they were like, mm -hmm. try, they were talking to us about how they could discuss the meaning behind the song. And it was really fun because it was like, yes, I think we can find a way to do this. Like, because what's really important is the, if it's a meaningful song in terms of emotional conveyance, and like a lot of that can be connectivity through whatever form. Because um, there's the two sides of storytelling and music, right? There's like what it says and how it makes you feel. Yeah, I mean, I guess the real true best music is combining them you know yeah, yeah. well when, you write, perfectly fine when well. you write music do you think about it that way or do you think about it because i this is a question i ask all the time and like okay some musicians i what i love to hear is like some musicians i've talked to say i just think about how it feels some people say i just think about what it says and then some really say like there's, it does, it's always different, but it, it feels like it's always fits one of those two calculus. It's like, does, does, is that even a good way of thinking about mine, it with your music? Mine feels like it's more of a, a story. You know what I mean? It's like a ride. It's like a roller coaster. And so you gotta, you gotta sprinkle in different elements. So you start the intro, kind of get it in, then you get them in there like, Yo, whoa, okay, I'm here. Uh, and then, you know, you say some stuff. And I feel like as long as it's something that fits the energy, it's good. Um, but it doesn't have to be any particular type of thing. Because sometimes they're just like songs about, they're like love songs or whatever, or they're a song about, like I have one that's just about people being on their phones too much or like on social media too much. Um, and I have other ones just about like, what it like feels like to get old and like be nostalgic or whatever. Um, and they all come across the same way in my opinion. Uh, as long as it just like fits. And why is it, why is it, and maybe this isn't even the way you think about it, but why is it important for you to convey those things in music form? What do you, what do you mean by important to convey? So, and maybe you're not even thinking about it this way, but yeah. why is it that, you're, you, ha you decide to use music to jump into those things on the one hand. And on the other hand, like, is it, is it the, is it the, does it, what, what about the music helps you understand that more? Or why is it important that you even think about an issue like people are on their phones too much and put it into song? What about putting it into song helps you understand or deal with or, uh, accept or whatever it might be um i feel like i feel things like that more for the sake of having something to write a song about than i do about feeling them and needing a way to get them out but i think they work in a perfect sort of harmony in that way because it's just such a big part of my life um, so that's great so the actual action yeah. of being a musician is how you found meaning in your life because it's helping you capture these events so it's almost like the catalyst. It's like keeping it's a definitely diary. definitely a nice part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It I think that's like nice. A lot. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of it's like, like journaling. It's exactly. A lot of journaling. Yeah. And I, like, it's making me think about like meditation in general, because the whole point is like, it's, it's about tapping into and remembering the points of your life and the facts that they matter, the fact that they matter, even the small mundane things and the huge things and like tapping into those and like, and focusing on them helps you maybe stay in the moment. And I also like when you have something like, I like the way you're thinking about this because it's almost like viewing your life as a journey that's full of experiences that you get to have. And like, it's almost like a celebration of the experiences that make you who you are when you use those as catalysts for music, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it definitely feels that way. And I could see, I don't know, it's kind of crazy to think about because I don't think about this kind of stuff that much. Um, but I can see what it's like to be someone 
who isn't interested in like being an artist or you know what I mean and just uh has a notebook with all their songs and they play them for themselves for themselves sometimes for other people maybe like whatever and that would just be like how music is a part of your life but for me it's just like I love the other parts of it too like you know like the post-production stuff like recording like marketing it like all that is like just part of the part of the thing for me that I enjoy but I could I could see just isolating like the part of it that would be oh I just do this for myself because it's just like what you're saying like sort of chronicling sort of celebrating these feelings sort of just like it's like you're tethered to the world in a way. yeah well I think everybody in their own way is an artist and like is creative in some way and what's beautiful is for you that's music and that's what I think is yeah. awesome but I do think that this is these are focusing on and thinking about life and the meaning in life in a, in different ways that aren't just fully rational is a part of everyone's being, which is why almost everybody out there. And I think everybody has some creative medium that resonates with them. Maybe they're a musician and, they, or they like to listen to music. Maybe they, maybe yeah. it's art. Maybe they like drawing. Maybe it's the way consumption is, is also can be its own version of it. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, we're all you, creators and consumers. That's like the purpose of art in general. You know, some people like to produce it. Some people like to consume it. Or a lot of people like to do both. Yeah. And yeah. so what about, I want to talk about Bed Bugs, the song Bed Bugs. Because I love, I, I like that song, man. I, I, and I like that it's, I like that it's on Insomnia. Because I like the, I like the yeah. fact that it's, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear like what what the inspiration was behind Bed Bugs and why that's meaningful for you. Yeah, well, the whole record is about insomnia, and I, I mean, the reason I did it that way is just because, like we were saying earlier, like how I write songs, I just write about whatever. And so we had a bunch of songs for the band, and I was trying to figure out a sort of like narrative way to divide them because I thought just like the idea of them all being conceptually related was cool. So I was like, love songs or insomnia songs and i was like ah, 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 ah. and i just chose insomnia <laughs> and that's like that's how it came to be because i just had both um and yeah so bed bugs in particular is the oldest one that we ever did as a band um which is so great that it was like the most loved one as well in, in that sense because every single like time we play everyone's like "Ooh, i'm excited to play bed bugs like it's gonna be a good time um but in terms of like writing it I was uh, I was living in my fraternity house my sophomore year, uh, and like there's nine rooms in the house. Eight of them are on the second floor. There's one in the basement. That's my room. It's the biggest room. It has its own bathroom. Everyone else shares bathrooms. I have my own. But I'm in the basement. There's not a lot of light. One, which is a, is not great. And two, there's lots of bugs. Uh, there's lots of roaches. There's like those centipede thingies, which we don't have those in California. I don't know what's up with those. Um, and when I first moved in there, I guess, like, I already had problems sleeping before that, which is why I have the other songs on the record, but there were, like, spiders, like, all over the place, and they bit me all the time, like, I, and I literally just, like, could not sleep, and I was, like, like, spy I didn't mention it in the song, like, it's not in the lyrics at all, but that's, like, where, like, the name came from. <laughs> Oh my God. It's like an ode to your basement bedroom in college. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, the, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Well, but, ha uh, have you found, so what I, have you found that other people, cause you were rather overt at least in this album and especially in the song with it being on insomnia. Did you find that other people caught on to that? Oh, for sure. Definitely. And I've had like, one of my favorite parts about it is I'll have friends text me at like 4 a.m. and they're like, like, I can't sleep, but I'm listening to this song and I just get it. <laughs> and that's like awesome. <laughs> that's super fun. <laughs> Whoa, for real? Like people would actually be like, so, so. They just message me late at night and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, yes, here. I'm listening. I'm with you. And I'm like, I'm up too. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> See, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? When you can like share that commonality like because that's so cool because that means that your music's resonating not only in, like it's like in a personal experience resonation as well as yeah that feels great like it's sonics. honestly the, the things you can see on spotify are crazy in terms of like 
demographics, who's listening where and stuff like this. And I mean, someone just like randomly, like, you know, like my second highest city is like Singapore or something like, you know, like they need like, to sleep better like, in Singapore, huh? Randomly. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> but, um, it's crazy. Cause you can just see like which playlist you're on and like what they're called and like also who made them. So I just like see the names of like people I know, like in this like list of playlists and I'm like, they put me on there. Like, that's so nice. Like I could, you know, that's really cool. Uh, and that feels like, you know, the whole thing about resonating, like that, that's just an awesome way to see that happen. Uh, yeah. So that was super cool. Amazing. So bed bugs is on insomnia. What, what other experiences are you capturing in these other albums? Do they have concepts yet? Hmm. Um, one of them is kind of just all the ones that we couldn't quite like finish and get out, like to do stuff more conceptually. Cause like the band fell apart or is falling apart. Uh, just, you know, time happening. Uh, and that one is, it's like split between a few things. A couple of them are love songs. A couple of them though are just about like getting old. But so one of them I wrote a while ago, which is funny because I was so much younger. Uh, and it was just about being in the future and looking back on my life and feeling regretful. And then like taking advantage of that, of realizing that now that that's like a possibility, I guess. Um, and it's such a funny thing because I wrote it like three or three years ago. And now I'm three years older and I'm looking back on my like younger self and I'm like, ah, oh, this guy. But I know that like, like I'm young now also. So that'll, that's one of those things where as far as the meaning goes, like that'll always be a thing back on me or like, I can like look back on throughout my life. Like oh, I remember when I was like playing this song and feeling this way about like what it meant. So I love it. Cool. I think time travel through music is really a fascinating thing in general. I've never heard those words before, but I know it's yeah. mean. Well, and well, another song I love is is Neil Young's "Old Man." It's one of my favorite songs, still like lyrically, because I just love the. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't coming at it the same way you were, but he was more, or he at least he says he was. He made the song when he met this old ranch hand who had been managing the ranch that he moved into, mm. um, and was thinking about what his life must have been like and connecting it to his struggles. Neil Young struggles um, in his life at a younger age. So he was actually going about it the other way. He was looking at an old man and thinking about how his life had been, might have been, and yeah. imagining how he might have lived in very different situations, but how si similar they are at their core. Um, yeah. You know, we're all just looking for someone to love us the whole night through, you know. Uh, you know. And it, it was interesting to hear you say that you wrote it as a young person thinking forward. And now that you're older, you're like more there. Yeah. It's like the reverse, but it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I feel like, um, that, that one, that one, I, I don't know. That one's great. But then for the other record I'm doing, um, they're all just kind of like, like cheap love songs, I'd say. <laughs> well, why, why does it meaning for you to, for you to write cheap love, love songs right now? Is there, there, I mean, all songs have a purpose, I think, really. Like, it's not that... Sometimes you need cheap love songs, man. I mean, was there... Were there oh, I love them. They're great. They're my yeah. favorite. <laughs> like, they come from different places, too. Like, sometimes it's, oh, I feel this way about this person. And then one could be, like, thinking back on a past feeling, like, oh, back then, like, this was this way. Or it could just be, like, I don't have anything going on, but I wish I did, and so I'm imagining, fantasizing, whatever. Um, and so it's a nice, like, they're all different vibes, but like the same, they're all basically like, Oh, I love you. Or, uh, you know, just cute little things. Oh, so how do you, yeah. uh, this is, how, how do you define yourself in terms of genre? Do you try to? Mm, I used to try to, but now I just say I'm like the strokes and back to market and people leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I'm, I try to experiment and change it up. So it's hard to say. Cause I feel like, one of the things that stopped me from putting out a lot of stuff, because I have probably 25 songs that are done enough to like release tomorrow, except that like my technical playing and like the way that I like arrange them and sort of like, I have like, all the song, but like there's so much more that goes into it when you're like recording it and making it like a full experience. Um, and so I, I go slow because I'm always getting better and I don't want to like be like, man, I wish I made that this year instead of last year because it would have just been so much better so it's like just trying to be proud of it i guess 
Well, the genre bending thing, I mean, I think like in other eras, it was all about like a sign of the times. Like you had a genre mm. or a song that was a sound of the times. And then you just had a few bands that were pushing the envelope. Um, that was probably just a function of, I'm sure it was just a function of what we saw and what we came across, what was famous. I'm sure there were a ton of musicians who were bending all types of things all across the board. Yeah. Plus you have always had musicians that are well ahead of their time. But I feel like what's interesting about our time now is that our pop and our pop music is really about bending genres now. Like that is yeah. really what it's, it's about. Weird to, it reached a weird meta level in that way. I've thought about that before. It's kind of crazy. I don't know where it's going to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that's like the fun adding, part. adding more new stuff. <laughs> but where does but that reach why, a limit? Oh yeah. But that's why I think the meaning behind it is what differentiates people a lot of the time is like you have these like sub genres of mm. rap of like of hip hop, of rock, uh, of pop yeah. that are basically the emotions that they're conveying. Cause that's the only common denominator. It feels like a lot of the time. That's a good point. That's a good point. But yeah, I've been thinking about that somewhat too. I don't have any answers on that front, but I just find it really interesting. Yeah, for me, it's been like listening to more foreign music that has opened my mind as far as like being creative or innovative at all. Um, because I listen to, you know, not like necessarily pop stuff and not that much rap, but like all the indie rock stuff, but it's all like American. And ultimately they're all part of like this same system. But then I started listening to like, Japanese like jazz and like this like Korean like R&B stuff and like French indie pop which is so good and also Indonesian alt rock is another great one and sorry see this is like but they all teach me different things about the ways that thing can, things can sound that we just never even hear over here yeah so no I love it like so in season one of the podcast we hosted um, like a podcast series as part of the China US music uh, summit at Berkeley School of Music mm -hmm. and it was so interesting because I was able to interview a couple, um, you know, it was Billy Gow and a couple others that musicians and producers uh, of, one was a producer of Chinese pop music um, and the other was like actually a musician making pop music. And it was so interesting because it's, it is fun to think about how much your geography can still play into mu your music, like, and how mm -hmm. culture, because it's so interesting to me because culture clearly plays a role in like defining each of us. And it shows up in our music as a function of that. But it's so hard to pinpoint sometimes what makes music from a pl specific place or what mm. about it made it really from this place other than the identity of the person writing it or making it or the language. But yeah, I mean, I guess like, you know, the culture is in the music and you, you resonate with that as a listener. And ultimately, if you're the person making it, it would make sense if you came from the same place where those people resonate with it. You know what I mean? Because there's just something about being from there that just like creates an identity that's just like inherent. But where's that come from is an interesting question. Just yeah. like the lived experience of all of them in this place, doing yeah. this, doing this lifestyle. I guess there's so many factors in people's lives. Exactly. And then there's also, because it's interesting, because I think it comes from the cultural perspective in terms of the meaning that's delivered, What, i.e. what emotions resonate with you. Like if you're going through a hard time uh, in, in a geographic area, might be going through hard times, so they might be feeling mm -hmm. specific emotions that might resonate on a pop level. But also in terms of tonality, like the languages that you grew up hearing, uh, especially mm. if you come from Asia, which has a much more fantastically tonal uh, <laughs> style to it than us, us Americans, the, yeah. the way that they listen to music like the things that they hear can be radically different in ways that we'll never understand because it's not like we can ever hear it through their ears but it yeah. is so yeah. interesting to see that play out and and see the ramifications even in sub areas of different places as well yeah what do you mean by sub areas just like smaller communities yeah like the small communities i mean even you know in the conversation i was having you know, they were basically saying they could, in the same way that we could connect music to different places, like in, in different states or even cities like Philly, uh, mm -hmm. they can do the same in China, but it is, in a, which is ob in a rather obvious thing to say, but it shows sort of the commonalities between like just the way that you create music across ge geographies and cultures. It's all very different expressions of similar phenomena, which is that, you know, every place is subtly different. What resonates with people is subtly different on multiple levels. And then what's popular in one area 
might also, there might be people in that area who don't care about it too, but it's just interesting that that, that, that plays a role, I think, in what's being produced, what's being heard and what's being felt. Now, I think technology and like the distribution of music, like Spotify and other things has really helped because now we have all this stuff at our fingertips to explore more and more with multiple genres and cultures, which is in part why I think we're seeing such a genre bending in like across the board. Yeah, Lil Nas X. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I also love <laughs> it too. Okay, so how do you it's feel? Great. Yeah, how do you feel then? And, and I, I can already feel you're going because you're like this yourself, but how do you feel about yeah. artists who've, just continuously switching up their music. I mean, because what's interesting is when you have someone like who feels like they're getting thrown into a box and they reject it because of their fame. How, what do yeah. you think on that? I feel like that's a personal choice at the end of the day. Because like for me, I wouldn't mind being in a box. I wouldn't, it wouldn't stop me from doing other things. Um, and I'm sure like some people would just love being in a box. And they're like, yes, like I'm getting, I'm just in my thing and everyone's loving it. That's what I want to do. And like, you know, it could be different for anybody. I think ultimately it's weighing priorities of like, am I trying to make money? Am I trying to make people love me? Or am I just trying to like express myself and do whatever? And I feel like everyone has their own balance. So how do you feel about that balance? Because it is a very notable and important thing. And we're talking about in the context of music, but I think that people have it in the context of anything that they feel passionate about is how do you mm. balance the fact that this is something that you love and it's a creative outlet. It's a way that you take actions in your life and sort of, you know, memorialize them. How do you balance that with the fact that you are a musician and you need to make it into a business, at least insofar as you need to sustain yourself or you'd like to sustain yourself as a musician in perpetuity. How do you balance those factors personally? Cause it's a hard one. I think that um, there's a certain amount of like, just trust in the process sort of mentality. Um, and I think that ultimately I'd be happier with like a small degree of fame doing what I want to do than like doing something I don't want to do. But I don't even know how I'd end up in a, in a position to like, I don't know. I would always just like be like, if this is what I want to do, I believe it, I can work it out. Um, yeah. That's just my mentality. I feel like that's just blind faith is the easiest way. <laughs> easiest way to go about it i, I respect it because i also think because i think intentionality a lot of times falls short because i don't think you can force these things like i don't think you can tell the world maybe you'll get thrust into a box musically and professionally and personally but and and maybe you'll be happy or unhappy there but i think regardless you can't pick your box a lot of the times like yeah I, like trying to trying to be a thing rather than just being a thing i feel like that's not going to be any better. Like, that's not going to, like, I'm not going to be better at trying to be something that I'm not than I would be at just doing my own thing. Um, so I don't really have that much faith in like trying to fit in anyways, because I don't think I'd pull it off. Yeah. And that's what I like about your music too. And I think, I think you're helped along that path because you pick real experiences, but I really think that intentionality is so important. It's something that we don't talk enough about because I really feel that you can do and say anything and have an impact if the intentionality is correct. And I think that actually uh, a big problem that we have in media and particularly as it relates to meaning is intentionality where mm -hmm. people are not doing it for the right reasons or the reasons they are doing it is more self aggrandizement, which is not a problem, but the problem is if you're driven to just try to get likes, for instance, or like try to make something yeah. that people will listen to, it, it forces you into to create media in specific ways. Like it's. It's so deliberate. Take the heart out of it. I don't know. And it, and it might lead you down meaningless rabbit holes as well. That might be very fulfilling. Well, that might be very lucrative or beneficial, but might, you know, you maybe shouldn't have gone that. Like, cause I feel like in, in our lives, if we lead with intentionality around trying to lead meaningful lives, then what's going to be reinforced and oppressed upon us when something occurs is whether or not it added meaning to our lives, which is why I like the yeah. way you write music, right? You're writing music to capture things and they could be silly things. They could be insomnia. They could be being stuck in that basement thing. What, they could one, be of them is about, yeah. one of them is about like the first time that I went to the grocery store in my life to get myself ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, which one is that? It's vanilla bean. Oh hell yeah! Is that a new is that a new one or on the old album? 
That's on the record. That's on the record. Oh, okay, I gotta check that out. It's the second I, to last one. I never it's, caught. Uh, I never caught that. No, it's really subtle. It's like it sounds like it's a love song. Uh, Maybe it is, man. Place. That sounds like an amazing experience, right? That's a great time. Oh, it was great. It was delightful. But yeah, I mean, it's crazy the way just the industry is going in general. Yeah. I don't really know what genre is going to mean at some point because I feel like everything just gets closer together. Yeah. Which is fun. Which is fun. That is, so, and that's the beauty of it. I think the experimentation is so beautiful. But that's also why I think if, if you can go about it from trying to deliver meaningful, like capture as much meaning in your life as possible, you'll end up mm -hmm. building a life with maximum meaning. It might not yeah. be maximum fame. It might not be maximum success, but it'll be maximum meaning to you. And I think that yeah. if, you, if you lead with that intentionality, as I, I hear in your songs, because you make them playful, you make them fun, and you also are just good at what you do, I think. Um, I think you fly under the radar so far. Um, but it's, if you do that, you're going to be happier, I think, at the end of the day. Because if you don't, what you're going to be chasing is some other goal. And you might even be successful at it. But, yeah. but I think that's why the intentionality in terms of meaning helps make sure that you're optimizing for the things that eventually that you as an old man looking back at yourself now uh, might go, that was what I really wanted to have been doing. And that's why I was doing what I was doing. Was exactly. I feel like I have a lot of friends. I mean, I go to like an Ivy League university, right? Um, and I have a lot of my friends who are just like trying to be consultants or trying to have jobs that I think are pointless, but that's a whole other story. But I just, I asked them the question, why? Like, why do you want to do this? And the answer every single time boils down to money. And I'm like, but why do you want to make this much money? Because you're really smart. You can do whatever you want. You can make a lot of money doing something else, just not as much. But also you don't have to work 60, 80 hour weeks as like a 24 year old. Um, and I feel like a lot of people, when it comes down to it, just don't really have an answer. Like you, and for me, it's just like to try to be happy and really be proud of, I guess, just how I live my life. But for a lot of people, it's just, uh, they like look into this hole and then they just turn away and they're like, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I think it's so important to have proper intention because yeah, I do too. Cause you always, it's like a guiding light. In a way. Yeah. And it can so be whatever you want. That's not to say that any attention or motivation is better than another. And that can manifest in a million different ways. But yeah, I mean, look, the reality is not everybody's meant to be a musician. There are some people that are going to live very happy lives as consultants. But I think to your point is sound, which is that, when you, when you make it so hard for people to feel like they can follow the things that they believe are meaningful, then yeah. the defense mechanism is to convince yourself that the thing that is inevitable to you or has been presented to you is the thing you want to do. So then it becomes impossible yeah. to know whether or not that's actually the thing you want to do because you've been so shaped by mm -hmm. what your reality is. And I think it's actually smart of them because they pretty much know that they have to go down this path. Like, I'm yeah. sure their, professor, their professors have trained them to go down this path. The school has been designed to go down this path. Their parents are mm. telling them to go down this path. It's, it's what we all have struggled with. I mean, I, I struggled with a similar thing where, I mean, I went about it in a slightly different way, but I thought that you had to work in big institutions. Uh, yeah. I started my career working in government because I thought that, that there was nothing bigger than, you know, cre cre and I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I just think that my, my purpose for doing it was because I thought, that it was, it was potentially most meaningful. But then as I was leading up to that, I, it, it became so difficult to see a road ahead. Um, mm. And even when I started paving one, it became very appetizing as things got difficult to try to convince myself I, wanted to, I, I should be a consultant or I should be mm. a salesman or whatever it should be. Because um, those opportunities presented themselves to me. And so I chose to do other things that certainly made me less money. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and others that paid off even monetarily, but it like, it was about trying to be, if you, if you try to think in a bigger context, and again, I'm lucky, I guess I have, I had enough money behind me in that, like I have stable family that would catch me when I fell and I, I fell already several times. Um, that was like a lucky privilege I had, I suppose. But yeah. if you decide that you want to go after the meaning in life or what's most meaningful to you and you open yourself up, to other possibilities, not just saying, do I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a consultant, a banker? Like what it's more like opening yourself up and saying, what do I really want to do? 
and what matters the most to me in your life can actually be freeing because it lets you at least make the choice about which box to eventually put yourself into. And you can be sure or more, more sure that it's, it's where you want to be. Um, and at the very least, you'll look back on those experiences as non-failures because you were searching for something that mattered to you. Yeah. For me, when I think about being older and like looking back on like the earlier parts of my life, I guess, there's like a feeling I can imagine of like having to try, like having tried to like chase a, a dream or something like that and failed. And then a similar feeling, but having never tried. And the latter seems like it would just be so much worse. Yeah. This comes um, up a lot in my life too, because I work with so many different startups. Um, yeah. As I was mm -hmm. in a, a venture capacity as well. Um, and so this always comes up because, you know, you're talking with founders and, and, you know, especially when things get tough and every startup, no matter what startup it is, went through something really tough at one point, like probably yeah. had, if not the joke is that it's like, it feels like every other day you think you're either going to be like killing it. Like you're just like, Oh my God, this is the best or you're going to die. And so mm. like when you go through that, how do you keep yourself motivated? And a lot of times it's, it's basically the belief. And I think that's why we reinforce the vision so much when we talk about startups is not necessarily because it mm. comes into the business itself, but because that is what's going to drive you through the hardest times is that belief that even oh, if I, I fail, never thought about that. Yeah. I think it's, I, I really think that's what it is. And I, cause I was trying to figure it out too, why as a VC, it was something that we were looking so closely at because in reality, the only thing you know, that's true about a vision is that it's not going to be the, the vision, the, what the, where the company it's is not going to be, that, be yeah. that. Yeah. So it's like, why do we care then about the vision? Right. And I think the reality is the reason is, is that you want your entrepreneurs and, and this is, you want yourself to be on a path that has a vision that is interesting and stimulating because that's how when you look back, success, first of all, I think it's going to optimize your chances of success. It's also how you sell things to people. Right. Because again, it, well, that goes to the Amazon ad. People want to feel right. things because, you know, the reality is almost everything that you buy, you could have chosen something else or someone else. I mean, in More listening to this podcast or listening to your music, they could have chosen any other podcast. They could have chosen any other song, but why did they choose you? They could have just gone on a walk, you yeah. know, like anything. Like <laughs> Yeah. Could, lot, oh yeah, you're right. It's they could have chosen anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's what's so hard in in life is like when you have this plethora of choice and you're competing over, you know, you're trying to figure out how to best orient the the small amount of time you have. And often in that small amount of time you have, you're trying to convince other people to use their small amount of time as well. And so yeah. that's sort of the beauty of where you can find meaning and 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 where I, feel like, I think it's about providing value. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're just using your time to make other people's time better. And then that makes your time better because you're making, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why that's in startup point. world and music, we always think about what, what's valued, right? And like, how does it make you, know. you feel? What are you going to do? Because in, in, in startup land, it's always about pain points and problems. So yeah, exactly. the best startups know intimately who they're helping and what they're helping them do. And they're solving some sort of problem. And so it really yeah. is about helping people live their lives better and, and solve a problem and, and solve a pain for them. And music, I think, is similar, but in very, very different ways, right? It's Because oh, first of all, it is a business too, but also it's more about like the emotions that you're conveying and everything else. But that's why I, I really want, and, and that's why we are trying to do everything that we can do to promote people that are actually putting out meaningful music. Because I think that when we, that artists hold a lot of power in our society, not just musicians, but the creators. No, it's very media. true. And so as do the curators. And that's another thing that we talk about on every yeah. podcast pretty much because it's such a big yeah. thing. But yeah. uh, that's another thing we'll try to tackle. But if we can reinforce great creators who are doing things because they, they mean something to them and are, and are helping other people think and feel things that matter, uh, that's something to be reinforced, I think. So 